Hey, Ben, is your pump running? My pawns are up. Uh, it's going to run pretty close uh, to 25 to 27. Uh, my practice runs have been just barely short of the bullet into an acceptable line. Uh, I may just leave off like the very last thing I wanted to talk about, depending on how time ends up going. <coughs> All right, so hi everyone. Um, welcome to my nonsense sci-fi general relativity talk. So what I want to talk about today is I want to go over the, I want to give you the fastest crash course possible in Riemannian geometry because I did not include that as a prerequisite for this talk. So we're going to go over that as quickly as we can, leaving out a lot of detail. Uh, probably making people who do know Riemannian geometry a little bit sad. And then we're going to go from there into uh, talking about general relativity. And the thing specifically I want to talk about is that in 1998, a man named Ken Olam published a proof that if you assume the right definitions and make the right assumptions, it's impossible to travel faster than light in our universe. Now this was in 1998, which is strange because uh, Einstein already proved that if you make the right definitions around 80 years ago. And the fact that this even happened just goes to show that when you're working in a relativistic scheme, talking about what it means to go faster than light is in and of itself a non-trivial problem. So when Ken Olam proved it, he proved it using a very restrictive kind of not fully general definition that at the very least has the good property that everyone can agree that this definition is in fact sufficient for faster than light travel. So to get started, we're just going to quickly talk about what a Riemannian metric is. So a good way to think about this is to think about uh, curves in R2. So if I have some curve, uh, gamma, in R2, then for one thing, I can, uh, you know, so gamma is mapped from some closed interval into R2. It's smooth. Just uh, so you guys know, a lot of the time I'm going to be talking about things, always assume I mean smooth unless stated otherwise, because everything is smooth. Um, and so you can write gamma you know, in terms of uh, coordinate functions. So this is our x component, and this is our y component. OK, so if you have this curve, there's a very standard formula for the arc length of this curve. You can write that the length of our curve gamma is equal to the integral from a to b of the square root of derivative of gamma 0 d lambda squared plus the derivative of gamma 1 d lambda squared d lambda. OK, so that's our formula for the arc length. And it's you know helpful if you want to compute arc lengths. But if you really pay attention here, there's something that should jump out at you. And it's this bit here. So if you remember the expression for the uh, tangent vector to a curve, we have that the tangent vector gamma prime is equal to d gamma 0, d lambda, d gamma 1, d lambda. So at every point along this curve, we have a tangent vector with components given by this. But these tangent vectors don't just sit in space, right? They sit in the tangent space to the manifold at each of these points. So if we go back to this expression for a minute, there's something that should really jump out at us, and it's that this looks a lot like it's the Euclidean norm of the tangent vector. So if you really think about it, what we're doing here is we're taking at every point the length of the tangent vector to the curve and then summing slash integrating over all of those lengths to get the length of the total curve. Now, it's really nice and convenient to be able to think about this as a Euclidean norm. But the problem is, normally when you talk about the Euclidean norm, you talk about it in terms of the dot product between vectors. That is, the length of a vector v is equal to the square root of v dot v, this dot product here. And if you remember your linear algebra, you'll remember that in order to be able to talk about a dot product between vectors, you need to be working in an inner product space. You need to live in a vector space that's equipped with an inner product. The problem is the tangent spaces to a manifold are not those. They don't have inner products the way they're normally defined. So when we want to talk about the arc length of this curve then, uh, a good, nice way to think about it is that we're kind of putting a dot product on each of these tangent spaces at every point in R2. And if we generalize that idea, that brings us to something called a Riemannian metric. 
So a Riemannian metric is an assignment of an inner product to every tangent space on a manifold. And then in your head, add the word smooth to that, but I'm not going to say it. So um, a Riemannian metric is an assignment of an inner product to every point on a manifold. And because I'm a physicist, uh, I'm going to talk about this in coordinates for a minute now. So when you have an inner product, so something that takes two vectors and gives you a real number and is linear in each entry, uh, once you've picked a basis, you can express this inner, there's, you can associate a linear operator or a matrix, because I'm a physicist, uh, with this inner product. So in particular, uh, there exists a matrix A such that uh, V inner W is equal to our matrix A applied to W, and then you're applying the dual of V to that. And this, uh, you know, mathematically makes sense because this linear operator applied to W is going to give you another vector in the space, and then a dual vector eats that and gives you a number. So you can always think about then an inner product in terms of one of these matrices. And in particular, you can think of it in terms of the uh, components, Aij, of this matrix. So when we talk about now a smoothly varying inner product on each tangent space, then what we're going to think about is a set of uh, n squared smooth functions, Aij, that give us the components of our metric. So uh, as an easy example, the dot product, so the, you know, the Euc normal Euclidean inner product uh, in two dimensions is given by this, ab dot cd is equal to ac plus vd. And obviously, you can write this as ab, and then the identity matrix, and then cd. And you do this computation, you're going to get that out. So the uh, matrix you can associate with the Euclidean inner product is just uh, that guy, the identity matrix. OK. So now we have this notion of a Riemannian metric. So now on our manifolds, we can talk about taking inner products between vectors in each tang tangent space. What's another nice thing to be able to do on manifolds? Well, if I have a vector in this tangent space here and a vector in this tangent space here, it would be nice if we could in some way compare them. Obviously, we can't because they're in different tangent spaces. But in Riemannian geometry, you can define a notion of parallel transport. So you can imagine sliding this vector along some path connecting the two tangent spaces until they're in the same space. Now, in order to uh, define this properly, you need to define uh, something called, in Riemannian geometry, a connection, and in general relativity, a derivative operator. And I'm going to be calling it a derivative operator because that's the terminology we're using for this talk. So um, without going into too much detail, because it's not super relevant here, a connection is a thing that satisfies all the properties you want a derivative to have. So, you know, it's, it's going to be linear, it's going to have a, some sort of Leibniz property, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but importantly, it quantifies for us how much a vector field fails to be parallel transported along a curve. So if we want to look at this, um, if we want to look at our picture of R2 again, if we put, you know, some vector field on it, and then we look at these two tangent spaces, and uh, you know we draw some curve that looks like this, all the way to this tangent space. This vector field is changing a lot along this curve. It's not being parallel transported. So on the other hand, if this vector field was, say, all vertical, then we could say that this vector field is, in fact, being parallel transported along the curve. If you start at this vector here and follow this curve, you end up there. So, uh, the way you do this is you end up writing down what's called the parallel transport equation, which just looks like this. Again, you don't really need to remember what this looks like, but so this is our derivative operator. Uh, this is our vector field. So it has uh, n components. This is our vector field. It also has n components. And then you uh, contract this with the tangent vector to the curve. So this is what's called the parallel transport equation. If that's zero everywhere, it means your vector field is being parallel transported along this curve. So the only reason I'm talking about this is because it's important to keep in mind when you think about straight lines. So if you have a straight line connecting two points in R2, what's really nice about it? A couple of things. For one thing, it's the shortest path connecting the points. Second thing is that the tangent vector to this curve 
gets parallel transported by the curve. Now it turns out this idea of being the shortest possible path between two points and parallel transporting your own tangent vector are very closely related. I don't want to quite say they're the same because they're not, but if something parallel transports its own tangent vector, it at the very least locally is going to be the shortest path between two points, if not locally. So we're going to come up with a name for this. It's going to be our generalization to arbitrary manifolds of straight lines. It's going to be called a geodesic. So a geodesic is a path that parallel transports its own tangent vector. So we can also write a geodesic equation. So in this case, this is the parallel transport equation, except it, we replace the normal vector field we were talking about with instead um, the tangent vectors to the curve. Okay, so that's all the mathematical preliminaries we need. So let's get on to talking about relativity. So, Newton's first law famously says that an object in motion remains in motion, and an object at rest remains at rest unless acted on by an external force. Um, if Newton knew about differential geometry, he would have said that objects that don't have force on them travel on geodesics. And it was one of Einstein's big insights that that's the case. So Einstein took the standard Newtonian picture of space and time as separate objects, and space is just being normal Euclidean R3, and said, rather than doing that, what if we combined space and time into one four-dimensional manifold and then put a Riemannian metric on it? And it turns out that that lets you explain gravity much better than Newton was able to. So in the Einsteinian picture, space-time is a manifold, M, with a metric G. Now, uh, I've been lying to you for the past uh, 10 minutes because when I say that a metric is a smoothly varying inner product, that's true in the Riemannian case. Unfortunately, space-time is what's called pseudo-Riemannian, which means your metric doesn't actually form an inner product. It gives you a thing that's a lot like an inner product, except it's not positive definite anymore, which means under this inner product, you can have negative length vectors and you can have zero length vectors. Um, so. As a toy example, because I really like talking about uh, flat space because it's easy to draw, we're going to talk about flat space. So uh, let's take R4, here drawn as R2, uh, and let this be our, we're going to let this be our position axis, and this be our time axis, so xt. In this case, uh, the metric on our manifold will be what's called the Minkowski metric. So we'll have g mu nu is equal to negative 1, 1, 1, 1 with zeros on the anti-diagonal. Uh, some people might prefer I write it with a one there and negatives there, but I'm not going to do that. So the important thing about the fact now that vectors can have negative length is that it gives us a notion of causality. So let's say we're looking in uh, Minkowski space-time. Oh, uh, sorry. The important thing that I should add is that under this metric, geodesics are straight lines. So this is a model for space when there isn't very much gravity. And it's probably good that you can retrieve from that that geodesics are straight lines. It would be bad if we had a theory of physics that said that things without gravity in place should travel in curves. This agrees with Newton's laws, which is great. So let's take a geodesic that looks like this, OK? Uh, it's just, just some straight line. Now, this is going to have you know, the same tangent vector at every point. It's going to look like this. Now, if you think about the length of this tangent vector, look at the way I've drawn this graph it travels through more time than it does space. So this, uh, each tangent vector then to this curve is going to have negative norm. So in particular, so we're going to have g mu nu v mu v nu is less than 0 for every tangent vector to the curve v. Because this means that the time part of this uh, curve is bigger than the space part, those are going to be called time-like vectors. Now, on the other hand, I could have drawn a curve that looks like this. In that case, the space part's bigger than the time part. Our tangent vectors are going to have negative norm, or uh, positive norm, sorry. So g mu nu, v mu, v nu is greater than 0. These are space-like vectors. The space part is bigger. Finally, uh, because the speed of light famously is equal to 1, uh, if I travel on a path that's exactly 45 degrees, this is called a uh, light-like, or null path. So it's going to be a path where all the vectors have norm 0. v mu v nu is equal to 0. Now, as it turns out, any, um, as it turns out, 
any path that something with mass travels on is going to be time-like. Its tangent vectors are going to have negative norm anywhere. Any, part of, any path that light travels on is going to be space, uh, sorry, light-like or null. I'm going to use the term null because it's easier to say. Um, and any particle, or sorry, any space-like path is not going to be traveled on unless you're talking about tachyons or some nonsense. Any, okay. Any time -like path. Sorry, any space-like path does not get traveled on. Time-like paths do get oh, traveled on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what that means is that you can draw a diagram that looks like this. This is our x-axis, this is our t-axis. You got these two 45 degree lines. They form what's called a light cone. So anything inside this light cone is something that I, if I'm sitting at the origin, can send a signal to. Because a signal will either be something with mass on a time-like path or something that travels at the speed of light on a null path. Anything outside this I can't interact with. I would need to go faster than light. Now what this means, and this is the really important part that you should take away from this, what this means is if I can travel more delta x than my delta t, so if delta x is greater than delta t, then I have traveled faster than light. However, in special relativity, in normal flat space with this metric, that's not possible. You are traveling on a time-like path, so your tangent vector is always negative, which means you can't do this. But when you go into general relativity, which I'm about to get to, this is not as much of a restriction anymore, because you can now work with an arbitrary metric. So what I'm going to write for you on the board is called the Alcubierre metric. So it looks like it looks like this, and uh, a bit of writing here. So it looks like this: g mu nu is equal to ah, negative one plus v squared f of r squared zero zero negative v f of r. Uh, just so you know, v and r are both functions of uh, coordinate time, um, but I'm not going to write that. 0, 0, 1. Okay. So if you write down this metric in uh, the usual R4, where v is some function of time, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter how big its magnitude is, f is, some, is what's called the form function. You normally take it to be some sort of like smooth plateau function like this, or uh, an analytic version of that, some approximation of it with arctans. And r is your usual Euclidean distance in free space. And so, as it turns out, um, what this metric describes is essentially in free space, um, if the time axis is coming out of the page, it defines a bubble. Outside of this bubble, space is flat because uh, you want your f to drop to zero when r is greater than a certain amount. But at the center of this, you want your f to be equal to one. As it turns out, if you're sitting right at the center of this, uh, you can a geodesic can be written at, like this. Uh, v of t, or uh, sorry, gamma of t is equal to t, 0, 0, xi, uh, xi of t, where xi of t is uh, a function that represents the center of this warp bubble we were talking about. So, and psi of t dot is equal to t. Now, if you think about this, we've just done something interesting, because I said earlier that uh, v was arbitrary. And so that means, in principle, you can take v to be as big as possible. V is the time derivative of your uh, z coordinate, which means that to an observer who's really far away from your warp bubble, where in the region where your warp bubble is, um, where your form function is dropped to zero, so to an observer who's sitting far away from you in flat space, uh, if this is our z axis and this is time, someone will actually be able to travel on an arbitrarily steep path just by picking v as big as you want. What's important is that the tangent vector to this is always still time-like under this metric. So the person is still going locally slower than light. They are just inside a bubble that is sliding through space at a speed that is faster than light, and they're floating right at the middle of this bubble. So turns out you actually can 
um, go faster than light. But the problem is it's non-physical. So if to explain why it's non-physical, I'm going to quickly tell you about the Einstein field equation. So the Einstein field equation is what you actually use to find the metric, given information about the mass distribution. So uh, the Einstein field equation looks like this. R mu nu minus 1 half R g mu nu is equal to 8 pi t mu nu. Now, um, a lot of these things aren't super important. This is called the Ricci tensor. It kind of describes the curvature of space. This is the Ricci scalar. It also describes the coordinate of, uh, the curvature of space. That's your metric, and that's what's called the stress energy tensor. Now, the uh, left side of this is um, involves a whole bunch of derivatives of your metric. This is a really hard equation to solve. Luckily, we're not going to be solving it. What we're going to be doing is we're just going to be taking a metric that we want, plugging it in to this side of the equation, and seeing what it does to this guy. So T mu nu is called the stress energy tensor. It describes the kind of mass and energy distribution in space time. Um, and in particular, you can write uh, the observed energy density by someone traveling on a time-like path, like this, v mu, v nu. So if someone is traveling on a curve with tangent vector v, this is equal to the uh, energy density they observe to be in place. So if this energy density, rho, is greater than 0, that's great. They observe positive energy there. If it's less than 0, they observe negative energy there. Negative energy, famously, is really weird. You don't really want that in your physical theories. It's unclear whether or not it even exists, and if it does, if you can collect it in large enough quantities. This guy, the Alcubierre metric, violates that energy condition. Rho is less than 0 here. So, in order to build an Alcubierre warp drive, you need negative energy, so that's bad. So then you ask the question, OK, so maybe in general, if you want to travel faster than light in general relativity, you need to be able to, um, you, need to you need negative energy. And so a guy named Ken Olam set out to prove that. But the issue that uh, he ran into is that it's really hard to define what you mean in the first place when you say faster than light travel. Like, let's say I give you a metric. So if I give you the metric, g mu nu is equal to negative 1 plus 4t squared x squared. Uh, this is going to be a metric on R2 for simplicity, but you could easily put this on R4 just by adding 1s on the diagonal. Um, If I have this metric here, and I uh, try to figure out what the geodesics are in this metric, specifically the null geodesics, then I will end up with an expression like this for a null geodesic. dx dt is equal to 1 plus 2tx over 1 minus t squared. So this will give me a differential equation for uh, null geodesics in this space time. It turns out a solution to this is one that has x of t equal to uh, t over 1 minus t squared. Now, if you think about what that looks like, this is our x-axis, this is our t-axis, what this means is that a null geodesic, in principle, can travel infinitely far by the time t goes to 1. So that would seem to be faster than light travel. But the problem is, this metric, up to a change of coordinates, if we define x prime is equal to um, x times 1 minus t squared, then this metric actually just becomes the normal Minkowski metric. Negative 1, 0, 0, 1. So this is actually just flat space. And so the problem you run into with talking about faster than light travel is that since general relativity lets you change the coordinates on your manifold however you want, it's actually not possible to, um, it's actually not really easy to talk about things like distance or travel speed because you can always change your coordinates to make something going slower than light look like it's faster than light. And so to resolve this issue, and I'm going to go over this quickly, I'm not going to go into that much detail because I'm running low on time, but to uh, resolve this issue, when Ken Olam wrote his proof about uh, energy condition violation, so proving that faster than light travel requires negative energy, he said this, we're only going to work in a system that looks like the Alcubierre metric. 
which means a system where there is a region where your metric isn't the standard Minkowski metric, but outside of that region, space is perfectly flat. So that, that way you have an observer in flat space who can be looking at things and to act as kind of the privileged coordinate system. That person will be able to tell whether or not stuff is faster than light. So what Ken Olin said is that you have some region that looks like this. Uh, if this is some time t naught, this is x1, this is x2. If you have some region like this that outside the region is perfectly flat, but um, the metric is changed in here such that a time-like traveler who enters this region can go on what apparently seems faster than light to someone outside. This is uh, T1, T2. Then you can travel through this with T, uh, with the property that T2 minus T1 is less than X2 minus X1. So you have some metric uh, that is perturbed in this region that allows this. And so what Ken Olam did during his proof, which again, I'm not going to go into too much detail on, is he basically said, OK, we're going to cut out this whole section of space time. So we're going to get rid of everything else. And then we're going to identify this space uh, the two ends of the space time along lines of this slope. So like this. And now we're going to talk about a new space time that looks like this. And what he said then was that in this space time now, um, it, there are closed time-like curves. That is to say time loops. If I go here, start here, cross the space time, I come out back here on the other end and then end up on this time loop. And there are a whole bunch of theorems published by uh, Tipler in 1977 that um, show that in any space-time containing time loops, you need either a black hole to show up and to be able to eat geodesics, or you need an energy condition violation. Now, since the original space, we said, didn't have any black holes, the new space also doesn't, which means the new space somewhere in this region needs to violate the energy conditions. And what that means is, the energy since the energy conditions are a local property just dealing with the distribution of mass and energy, if there's a point in here in which the energy conditions are violated, when we go back to our original space time, the energy conditions are also violated. So what that means is, any time you're trying to come up with a faster than light travel scheme in GR, which involves a flat background and a uh, spatially bounded perturbation to your metric, you need negative energy. So this is a pretty strong blow to humans being able to reach the stars in our lifetime, unfortunately. And uh, thank you all for listening.